It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 278 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday, the 15th of October, 2017. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by an old friend who we haven't heard from for a while, Dr. Shane Joseph. Oh, g'day everyone. <laughs> um, thanks for having me back. <laughs> I, it, was a, it was a severe case of computer just not working. Computer and, died. It took us a while yeah. to get your replacement. But you're back, yeah. which is good. And also joining us is Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. So we're all back actually after a bit of a break while I was holidaying in France and Italy. And while we were gone, the Nobel Prizes and the Ig Nobel Prizes were announced. We will of course be covering the Igs a little later on, but today's show is going to be about the Nobel Prizes. Once again, the Science on Top team snubbed by the Nobel Committee, not even a nomination. <laughs> The judges just don't seem impressed by our paper mache volcanoes, so better luck next year. What about year. our dedication to Australian podcasting? Yeah, that, that's a Ed, new Nobel Prize they need to invent, I think. Ed, Ed, I've never even seen a paper volcano, let alone made one. What are you talking about? Paper mache volcanoes. You know, have you Whatever, not seen not... every science fair well, uh, on American television? I've seen on the movies and stuff, yes, but I've never actually seen one in real life. And no, I think my life is not any poorer for it. I've made one out of sand and one out of clay. I've put red food dye. I'm on top of this. <laughs> and where's your Nobel Shane, Prize? Let me, let me show you. I'll come to your house. We'll make a volcano. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Cool. Um, Great. But... Who wouldn't want to do that? Come on. That sounds awesome. It's fun. It's uh, it is. Arts and crafts. I hate but it. it so what... many alternative conceptions. No. Like, anyway. I hated paper mache as a kid. Uh, I'm not gonna like it any better as an adult. So why would I? Yes, I'm a party pooper. I know. Just. <laughs> oh, we've so... missed you. Well, <laughs> wow, so I... <laughs> silence is like you're judging me. Like you, you. Monster. I'm just like I'm not gonna invite you to my next paper mache party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. Do you have a lot of uh, paper mache? I, I, my heart breaks, finished? man. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Should we start again? Nah. Let's just plough on and get serious now. The Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine was awarded to three American scientists, Jeffrey Hall, Michael Rosbash, and Michael Young, for their discoveries of molecular mechanisms controlling the circadian rhythm. Penny, this is all about why we go on... and we have trouble when we go on night shift and how the body regulates things with the day holidays. and night cycle, isn't it? <laughs> It is, it is. Um, and this is one of the Nobel Prizes in Medicine that I'm like, oh, actually, I get it and it's <laughs> interesting and, like, not just I can see that that's worthy but I don't really understand why, you mm. know? Because yep. I, I have to say, despite teaching biology, the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine is often way above my head. But circadian rhythms are really, really, really fundamental and important and because we've understood about them or, you know, broadly about them for a while now, it's sort of so obvious. It's hard to imagine thinking we need to discover this. But um, they're essentially, as Ed said, these regular sort of 24-hour cycles of day and night that um, we experience have led to the evolution of biological clocks in our cells and not just human cells but a lot of organisms, including plants, and I'm, I'm not sure, you know, of a complete list, but they're pretty fundamental, um, biologically speaking. Uh, and what they, sorry, Hall, Rosbach and Young have discovered or, you know, worked on over their careers were essentially how these rhythms are controlled by different genes. So it's not just one gene that controls the rhythms, but lots and lots and lots of different genes working together with proteins in a sort of a feedback loop. So there's some genes which are activated, they produce some proteins. These proteins build up to a certain level, which causes the genes to be switched off. The proteins then degrade and the genes switch on again 
taking on starting that cycle again. So it is kind of like a clock in terms of building up and breaking down. So it doesn't need day and night to happen. In fact, one of the very first observations that led people to think that there was such a thing as a biological clock was noticing that plants would open their and close their leaves um, even if they're in darkness. So they open and close their leaves, you know, in night, light and dark, but even if they're not exposed to light, they still do that, I'm going to say behaviour, I don't know if that's <laughs> quite the right word Good for enough. plants. Good enough. So I'm guessing, you know, each individual gene discovery that's um, working with the circadian clock is a small thing in itself, but they've worked for so long to name or not, I'm not going to say all the mechanisms, but, you know, so many of the mechanisms that control this clock that we really understand it. We're starting to understand it quite well. And it's really something that it's not just um, a a sort of a biological curiosity. It has real impacts on people like shift workers. um, Jet lag. He says, having just returned from Europe. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. our heart bleeds for you, Ed. So. Yeah, oh, it's terrible. Um, and it is quite complex because it can be reset. As Jet, as Ed has just learned, you know, <laughs> going to Europe, he had to reset his clock and it does reset. Mm. And coming home, I guess, reset that again. Coming home is harder, trust me. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's because of the reverse time. Yeah. 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 Um, um, but, but these circadian rhythms are also, we're talking hormonal releases as well, mm, uh, mm. blood pressure changes, blood... Um, yeah, oh, body yeah. temperature changes. Like it's not just sleeping and waking. Yeah. It's a whole bunch of things. Yeah. What um what I really like about this is that they um the the um, Benzer and Konopka, Konopka, the ones who um sort of were I think the two of the three, the way they did this was looking at fruit flies. And that through the fruit fly is a fairly common um tool to be used in genetic manipulation. And and, and, you know, you hear a lot of people criticising the use of animals, animal models in in science, and saying, "Well, how how can that relate to humans?" Well, in this case, it does because mm. the genes that they discovered in these fruit flies have analogs in humans and fungi and a whole lot of other things. And so, and that, and they looked at a really simple thing. They looked at things like I think um the way when the pupae emerge of these fr- fruit flies because they only emerge at certain times of day. Mm-hmm. And so they could basically time this and say, well, okay, which ones are, you know, the ones that appear at all at the same time will assume that they're okay. Some of them appear at different times. So that means the, the you know, the genes that are controlling these must be a little bit wonky. Yep. And that's how they figured out these mutant strains. And that's how they honed in on these genes. So, yeah, it's amazing that, you know, and this was back in the, when, was, when did they do this work? This was back in the 70s, wasn't it? It was started in the 70s, mm. yeah. So, you know, it was... <laughs> Actually, well, or 80, yeah, in 1984, that's when they first sort of discovered this. And this was, you know, t- t- more than 20 years ago. So using what we now would consider to be primitive genetic techniques. So it was, it was, it would have been a hell of a lot of work. It would have been really hard work, quite painstaking and, yeah, very meticulous and quite elegant. So <laughs> kudos to them. It was, it's great work. Yeah. Worthy of a Nobel Prize. Mm. I think we agree on this one. <laughs> <laughs> So the Nobel Prize in Physics went to another three Americans, with one half to Rainer Weiss and the other half jointly to Barry Barish and Kip Thorne for decisive contributions to the LIGO detector and the observation of gravitational waves. Lucas, there's a bit of controversy about this one, but let's go into what gravitational waves are again. We've talked about it quite a bit. These are the ripples in the space-time continuum, aren't they? (laughs) <laughs> um, I suppose. Why is that funny? Yes. I was thinking the same it's, thing. Well, because it seems very Star Trekky. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I remember the the surprise to find out that time dilation is actually a thing. <clears throat> Nothing Star Trek is made I, up. I thought it was about? a made up Star Trek thing for the longest time. But anyway. Okay. Um. So yes, it is kind of sort of uh, a, a space-time, you know, timey-wimey, stretchy thing. But um, um, <laughs> basically, if you if you imagine uh, if you imagine uh, space, uh, if you imagine a sliver of space, like a cross section of space in in more or less a two-dimensional plane, um, a, a, a gravitational wave would have the effect that the uh, the two, the 
uh, one axis would be stretched outwards and the other axis would be pulled inwards almost like stretching a you know like like a piece of lycra or something like that piece of material and that's that's basically what the um, what what these gravitational waves or how they affect the space around them so they've long been theorized obviously it came out of um, uh, Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity so this you know long been predicted as a thing um, but uh, it had not been uh, observed so it had not been backed up with uh, observational uh, um, uh, evidence that they did exist. So way back in the, well, way back, I'm going back to around the time I was born in the 70s, um, these, uh, a couple of gentlemen got together, uh, this is uh, Ray Weiss and uh, Kip Thorne got together at a hotel somewhere and, uh, and they were talking about how they would go about detecting gravitational waves and that actually was the beginning of this collaboration that, um, that later included thousands of scientists all around the world, uh, including Barry Barish. Um, who they basically designed the um, what would become LIGO, um, and we've talked about LIGO on the show a number of times. We've had some guests on talking about LIGO, so I won't go into the experiments in any detail here. If you're interested, by all means, go back and have a listen to those shows. Had some good shows on those, um, but LIGO and then the Virgo collaboration as well uh, were, were a couple of uh, these these very prominent. Um, uh, studies and, and experiments that were set up to use lasers and the fact that that light travels over a predictable period of time in order to uh, test or, or detect the existence of gravitational wave. So this this went on for quite a while. Um, the the uh, the experiments or the the initial LIGO detector was was running for a number of years. Uh, and it was more of a proof of concept of the technology than anything. And then when they, they went live with the what was known as the advanced LIGO, um, when that went live, it was really only, a, I think, a matter of weeks until they detected the first gravitational wave. And we did a story on that once the announcement was made the following year, uh, which is just so freaking cool. I mean, you, you just couldn't hope for a better outcome, I think, to, to go, OK, now we have a detector that is actually capable of detecting a wave. Oh. We just had our first detection. <laughs> That's just so freaking cool. But yeah. um, I think what really, what what really struck me about uh, about this story and what has struck me about this uh, Nobel Prize that a that this this all unfolded from our perspective very very quickly. But in reality, it's as I say, it stretches back over forty years. How long they were mm. they were planning mm. and and talking about this this uh, uh, this experiment. And it's ongoing. I mean, now there, there are, as we've discussed already in the show, there, there are more experiments planned. There's some pretty, you know, uh, wild stuff uh, involving, um, you know, space probes and much larger detectors over much larger areas that could detect much smaller uh, disturbances in the force, so oh, to speak. God. So um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's cool. It's, it's really, really cool. And, and, uh, and we've sort of seen the whole thing unfold you know, from from in terms of the uh, you know public awareness of it uh, during the span of this show, which is which is always fun as well. Um, there's there's been people involved in this all over the world, and I think one of the one of the things that the um, the recipients of the prize have, have gone to great pains, I think, to point out is that this is all a collaborative effort, and there were so many people involved in it. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, to receive the Nobel Prize, although, you know, a huge honour, it's also, uh, I think, you know, very much beholden on the people who do receive it to acknowledge that, you know, the, although their roles were pivotal, there were, there were so many people that, that were necessary to make it happen. Um, yeah. So, that yeah. The controversy and I, and I think, that I was alluding to was that there's mm. so many people um, involved in this. To, to then only give it to three people is almost kind of reductionist in some ways, but they were... As you say, pivotal in the conception and development they will. I mean, it, of this. Yeah, absolutely. It, entire if, field. If it had ha <laughs> yeah, that's right. They created the field. You're exactly right, and I think that's why you know they, they're certainly very deserving of it, uh, based on everything I've read. That, that and they they are you know giants in in this field, the field that they created. So if you're going to award it to anyone involved, then they seem appropriate. Um, and yeah, uh, I, I think. Uh, the controversy will always be. Um, I, I think it's more of a controversy that you you can't unfortunately receive a Nobel Prize posthumously because there are a lot of people mm. who, uh, who perhaps would have received a Nobel Prize had they lived long enough to uh, you know to be considered. So, but hey, that's that's uh, that's the way it works. They're the rules. Yeah, them's the rules. All right. 
The Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to Swiss biophysicist Jacques Dubochet, American biophysicist Joachim Frank, and Scottish molecular biologist Richard Henderson for developing cryo-electron microscopy for the high-resolution structure determination of biomolecules in solution. This is basically yet another Nobel Prize awarded for a method of viewing the very, very, very small. Like in the past, we've had Nobel Prizes awarded for X-ray crystallography, for electron microscopy, and lots of other ways of viewing tiny things. But this is basically a refined, high-resolution version of electron microscopy. So an electron microscope works by, instead of focusing a beam of light on the subject, it uses a beam of electrons, which gives you a pretty good view of something at a close-to-atomic level. The problem with that is a beam of electrons can damage organic tissue and it also needs to be done in a vacuum, which can damage living tissue. Uh, so for a long time, electron microscopy was only ever done on dead uh, structures. And you don't want to use crystallography on organic structures because when the water crystallizes, it becomes hard to see through ice crystals. Basically, these scientists over the last 30 to 40 years have developed a technique to get around those limitations called cryo-electron microscopy. The cryo is short for cryogenic. They basically freeze the material very quickly to, I think it's less than minus 150 degrees Celsius. Do you know, Shane, if I'm right there? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, minus 190, which is... um 190. Uh, uh, Wow. Yeah, which is, I think, is it lower than liquid nitrogen? I can't even remember. Um, anyway. It's very cold. I think we can agree on that. <laughs> um, when they freeze it really quickly, they get around the crystallizing problem because the water ends up with a more glassy structure than an icy crystal one. You know when you have ice cubes in the freezer and they sort of are murky and hard to oh. see through? By this cryo-freezing thing, it makes it a lot clearer... And it also reduces the amount of damage that the electron beam does. So you end up being able to take a very high resolution image at an atomic level of biological materials. Like the example that keeps being brought up all the time is the Zika virus. Within a few months of that outbreak, we had really good images of the virus itself. So you get lots of applications now for pharmacology and um, targeting proteins, the, the whole lock and key analogy sort of thing. It's It's... We're really at the beginning of a new era as the technology is developing, getting a lot better and a lot cheaper. We're going to start seeing a lot of very cool things, I think. Mm. So I are they the... Sorry, go on. I was going to say, I was just going to mention that the Zika virus is very, very beautiful. <laughs> if you look at the picture. No, it's, it's, no, it's a very beautiful structure. Like it's, I'm not saying it's not a horrible disease, but the actual structure of the, of the virus elegance is amazing. To it. Yeah. The Zika virus had a lot of nice things to say about you as well, Shane, so uh, that's nice. That's very nice. We'd always hoped you two would get together. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, are these things, are these, uh, these microscopes now uh, common? Are, they, are there lots of them around? Can you pick one up down at JCAR? Or? <laughs> they have definitely come down in price and gotten a lot more widespread in the last five to ten years. I don't know how common they are in terms of does every lab have one? But they are definitely becoming a lot more widespread. They'd, they'd still be very specialised pieces of equipment and very expensive. But um, And I'm guessing there's a fairly high level of technical proficiency you need to operate one. So I don't think they'll be, you know, just in the corner of a lab anytime soon, and, you know, like a little light microscope. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. As a little fixed series, I'm saying. Not, not, not soon. We were saying Matt, yeah. about um, you know, genetic sequencing and how you know True. that was an expensive and time-consuming process 10 or 15 years ago, and now it's mm. very, very common. So. Uh, who, yeah, who well, knows, maybe in the next 10, there's 20 years. Yeah. available on, um, from gumtree.com. There's none there now at the moment. None on eBay? Give it some time. <laughs> I haven't checked eBay. Please I've only checked Gumtree. Please tell me you actually searched on Gumtree for... I did, just then. Cryo Electron Microsoft. Awesome. <laughs> What would you have done if you'd found one? Just oh, I would have. I would have sent. The, I would have sent a question to the seller. <laughs> um. like, Excuse me, where did you get this? And is it, is it legitimate? <laughs> and, and, and what sort of freight options are available, or do I have to pick it up? 
I, I somehow think that just by doing that search, I think you've triggered a few things on <laughs> ASIO servers and everything. Like, why is this guy looking for cryo-electron microscope? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's better than the list I usually end up on. So, yes, yeah. <laughs> when you're searching for particle accelerators. Well, of course. But uh, so those are the science Nobel prizes for this year. Uh, very cool and deserving uh, breakthroughs, I think. All right, Penny, let's talk about jellyfish then. Let's move on to something a little bit different. They don't have brains, but some scientists have recently shown they still sleep. How does a jellyfish sleep? I think in a way it's a fast and loose kind of use of the word <laughs> sleep. But as it said, jellyfish don't have brains. I love, I'm always fascinated by jellyfish. They also don't have anuses, fun fact. Um, so everything goes in and out the same entrance, exit, multi-purpose hole. Um, it's quite so, convenient really if you're a jellyfish, I guess. It's quite convenient. Mm. Um, so when we think about sleep, I mean, in some ways, sleep is a very human thing. I mean, various scientists have argued that only mammals and birds sleep, um, some will argue that insects can sleep. Some even argue for sleep-like states in plants. Um, so sleep is a bit vague, but I think it's obvious that there is some kind of, and it's related to but not necessarily controlled by circadian rhythms. These jellyfish, do they sleep? Do they do anything that could be described as a version of sleeping? And I think it's really important which is something I found myself doing, is not to get into this sort of fallacy of pre-evolution. Oh, look, jellyfish are, you know, simple, so therefore they're primitive, so therefore they've evolved this so that later on smart animals like that, us will be able to sleep. But seeing it as something that's probably adaptive for that organism and remembering that it's been evolving for as long as we have, even if the changes have not been that dramatic. So this jellyfish is called Cassiopeia or Cassiopeia, I'm not sure. Um, and it's interesting because instead of floating around like you think of a jellyfish doing, it sort of lies on its back with its tentacles up and filter feeds. And in the daytime, they pulse and are kind of active feeding. At night, they're less active and they're less responsive. And so um, Ravi Nath, Claire Bedbrook and Michael Abrams, who are working at the California Institute of Technology, did some experiments to investigate this behaviour in jellyfish. So there's three things for um, three ways of judging if something, if an animal sleeps. So you have to look for patterns of activity and inactivity and what they did is designed an imaging system to count the jellyfish's pulses. So they found that the jellyfish are on the whole 30% less active at night. Um, so are they sleeping? Sleeping is not just about being inactive. There's other criteria. So first of all, the inactivity is reversible. So if you can't wake up, you're comatose. You're not asleep. So... What happened if the jellyfish were offered a snack at night, they became just as active as they would be by day. Ah. However, even though you can wake up, you are a bit unresponsive. It's harder to wake you when you're asleep or to get them to get something that's sleeping to respond than it is if it's awake. So to test for that, they put the jellyfish in a PVC pipe with a bottom, lifted up the pipe and then dropped it Um poor little jellyfish the jelly the animal doesn't like floating so it swims down to the surface when they did that at night they were slower to do it imagine if someone you know got you out of bed at night you would be a lot slower to sort of respond and go what's going on uh -huh. same with yeah. the jellyfish um the finally thing is if animals that sleep that are deprived of their sleep they suffer so i'm sure we've all spent a night awake for some reason mm -hmm. hopefully not jet too lag. bad, but jet lag, <laughs> doing an essay, doing work, at a party, who knows. <laughs> and you're always very tired the next day, you're not so great, and it takes a little while to recover, including a night of sleep usually. 
So they did this to the jellyfish. They kept them awake, <laughs> so to speak, one night by blasting them with water every 20 minutes. And that made the jellyfish pulse really quickly before they went back to their inactive state. And then the next day they were less active. However, if they delivered those water jets during the day, when the animals were active anyway, it didn't really have that effect. So that's really interesting. And I think it's interesting because usually sleep is studied by strapping electrodes to the brain and, you know, looking at different patterns of brain activity. But jellyfish do not have a brain. I think they've got like a few little ganglia or aggregations of nerves, but nothing that you could really measure. So... That's an I impressive guess. battery of tests, though. That's pretty comprehensive. It is. And they're quite elegant and quite simple. And I'm, I'm, I'm not a sleep scientist, but to me that seems not convincing that they're sleeping, but it definitely shows that something is going on, whether or not we define it as sleep, which, su which suggests, I guess, that this I don't know how to say this, but this need for sleep is something very, very ancient and deep-rooted. It may not be related to the complex brains that vertebrates or some vertebrates have, mm. but something really, really basic in the cells called neurons that the nervous system is made up of. So I, I think this is fascinating. I mean, I am always fascinated about sleep. It seems such a mysterious process. Yeah. And I would love to hear more. Well, we've talked before about how it's – from an evolutionary point of view, it seems like a dangerous thing to do. It's putting you it in a vulnerable state where you can be swept up by predators. And I remember we did talk about an experiment that seems to show in humans, it's a lot of washing the brain while we're asleep where it flushes away debris and um, de uh, just dirt sort of thing. And it's also been shown to solidify memory and stuff. But when you don't have a brain, you surely wouldn't need to sleep because of those reasons are all brain related. So it's but, very yeah, interesting that it happens in process. Jellyfish. Yeah, it was happening anyway. Mm. Then those other functions get locked onto it. But I mean, one, what's the real or the fund of, you know, the basic reason? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I, I thought this say, was a really interesting story. Sorry, Ed, did you say we have dirt in our brain? How the hell did we get dirt? Dirt was not the right word to use, and I was trying to think of okay. a better word, De but I couldn't think of it, debris. so I said dirt. I did say debris, yeah. and then I you said debris, another then adjective. You said dirt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> dirt, <laughs> thinking, debris, whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit disturbed by that. Um, oh, go on. We all know you've got a dirty mind. I want... <laughs> Tish. I want... Oh, man, I left I wonder, it wide open for you, didn't I? I really did. Just, Can I just say, this, this story, the thing I really liked about this was the fact that... Um, it sort of showed that you can construct experiments with what you have at hand. I mean, they, they talked about how, for example, uh, they started uh, studying the Cassiopeia in their own apartment, eyeballing the movements of the bells uh, of the jellyfish by the light of their iPhones. Um, <laughs> and then, then, they, then they started to construct um, some imaging equipment to take, uh, to take photographs of these things um, over and over again during the night. And, and before long, they had a cryo-electron microscope. No. <laughs> <laughs> no we just got a, yeah, eBay is the place to go, by the way. <laughs> um, so, and then, you know, they were using, um, like, this PVC pipe with a screen on the bottom was the thing that they used to drop them into the, the water. It's, it's like none of this is stuff that's absurdly, you know, this is specialised lab equipment sort of thing. I, I like that. Mm. Shows you don't have to have a white coat in a fancy lab. Anyone can do science. No. Sort of. No. <laughs> Not everyone, but many people can do some degree of science. All right. Well, Lucas, there's good news for anyone who's had that wayward feeling that maybe half the universe was missing, because a team of <laughs> astrophysicists have found the missing matter. I'll be honest with you, I didn't know there was any missing matter. What the hell is going on in this story? This, this one was, um, it initially caught my eye because I, I thought when I read the headline that, I'm sorry, have we found dark matter? Is this what mm. this is saying? Could they have made this headline any more clumsy to say, oh, by the way, we found dark matter? I mean, that's a big deal. That's a Nobel Prize winning big deal. Um, mm. No, haven't found dark matter. No dark matter found. Oh. Dark matter is still a problem. Most of the universe is still missing. So we can tick that off. Uh, turns out, 
we've been missing some baryonic matter. We've been missing some matter matter. The thing, the matter that we're all familiar with, the matter that you and I love, uh, has been missing uh, for quite some time. It's matter that we knew were, that was there because we could um, we could see that it was there in the very very early makeup of the universe. It's evidence in the because of microwave background. It's evidence in in uh, in structures that are that are really really far away from us. If we look, you know, if we look at really ancient galaxies, that there are therefore a long way back in time, um, we can see signs of this this matter there. Um, but a, a problem that has existed for quite some time more locally is the matter appears to be missing here. We don't seem to have the amount of, of, of matter, of baryonic matter here that we would expect to have. So this has been addressed um, by two different teams who basically did a whole lot of I can only really liken this to photo stacking. Um, they've taken some um, data from from different um, from, from different surveys. Uh, basically, they've used uh, a Planck satellite um, map uh, that they um, that they took. So this is um, the the uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, they were able to then overlay onto uh, a whole lot of imaging that they that that had been taken earlier on. Um, and like we're talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands to millions of of, um, of images stacked together of uh, pairs of galaxies that they had selected, and what they were looking for was uh, links between the galaxies. So the gaps in between the galaxies, they were looking in there at an um, uh, for a type of matter, uh, this, this baryonic matter that they feel that may have actually stretched out between the galaxies. And that's basically what they found. They found that there's a whole lot of matter that was stretched like tendrils between these galaxies, which had previously eluded detection because it's too cold. Uh, it doesn't radiate in the infrared. It's, it's only a few degrees above absolute zero. It was really, really difficult to find. Um, but they were able to find it by stacking these images. And uh, when I say imaging, I'm, t I'm using the, the term in, the, in, the, in a very loose fashion because these are not, mm. you know, these are not... Um, um, oh, photos, photographic images. Data. Yeah, there's not visible light that we're talking about, and uh, so by stacking them, they are able to to build up. They are able to to bring detail out, and uh, and and what they found was that they were basically um, there's almost three times um, uh, more density of matter in between the gal the um, these galaxies than they would find in in similar you know areas of dark space. Which is very interesting because we, we we consider the you know this area between galaxies to be this this you know intergalactic you know nothingness void, uh, and it isn't. There's actual you know there's there's extra baryons that have been you know uh, stretched in between them, which is which is kind of cool. So this problem that you may not know existed uh, now probably has an answer that uh, is not such a big problem after all. And then of course the question becomes why? Why is it stretched out between the galaxies? Are these is this a layover from um, you know galactic interactions previously? Have the galaxies passed through each other previously, which is quite feasible. Um, you know, we know for example our galaxies probably cannibalized a whole lot of other smaller galaxies over the over its lifetime. But yeah, it's it's kind of cool. And the way that they did it I also quite liked. Right. Baryons. Baryons. I've got to say, Lucas, I'm still not quite sure what baryonic matter is and how we could even have been missing it in the first place. Oh, just Google it. <laughs> <laughs> is that where it gets a bit too complicated, is it? <clears throat> Pretty much. I mean, it, it, think of baryonic matter as, as, as physical matter that we're, we're familiar with. This is, um, uh, this is the matter that makes us all up. Um, that that's kind of what we're talking about here. It's not it's not exotic matter. It's not dark matter. It's not things that we haven't defined. It's it's the matter that we all know and love. Fair enough. Baronic matter, you know, it's it's used in this sense to mean just the matter we're familiar with, because baronic matter specifically means things that are made up of protons and 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 neutrons, i.e., the atomic nuclei. Um, but they, they don't include, you know, electrons and neutrinos and so forth because they're actually called leptons, a class of uh, matter called leptons. So, but in the terms of, uh, in astronomy and what they're talking about here, 
uh, Berenic matter basically loosely collects all of these things together. So it's it's all of the things that are made up of atoms, effectively, is, is, is what this sort of simplifies down to. So it doesn't include things like neutrinos and so forth. Well, I'm glad they've found it. That's very reassuring. <laughs> it is. All right, Shane, let's talk about the Kakapo, because this is likely to be the very first species to have its entire genome sequences in the genome of every animal in that species, which sounds like a really impressive thing until you consider that there's hardly any Kakapo left. Yeah. First of all, what is a Kakapo? So a Kakapo um, is a... It's the only flightless parrot in the world. It comes from New Zealand. Um, like a lot of the birds there, it basically evolved to be flightless because, um, as far as I'm aware, because uh, New, Zealand, New Zealand was such an isolated place, um, that's one of the reasons anyway, there were no ground scavengers as such, like there were no rodents, anything like that, before humans came. So birds evolved to fill that niche as ground scavengers. And that it gave rise to things like the kiwi, for example, um, which is a very, which, which is the more famous flightless bird in New Zealand. But the kakapo is probably, it's it's a bit like the panda. It's um, it's kind of useless. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> it, it, it really is. It's it's a very cute looking bird. Um, it's very slow. It doesn't, it can't fly, as I said. Um, and apparently it has. <laughs> According to the article, and in, yeah, a, a, na- a naivety towards danger and a habit of freezing when threatened, which basically means I think you can saunter up to one and whack it on the head, and it won't do anything. Like it's just, <laughs> which is why when the Maori came in the 13th century, they wiped almost wiped them out. Mm. Mm. Um, they used them for food, for, for, for clothing. Um, they brought dogs and rats over, and that finished off a lot of them too because you know the, these parrots had never seen this before so they never evolved with them so um yeah they they died in on mass and when the europeans came apparently that's when you know they, and they brought like stoats and weasels which are ground scavengers <laughs> and just went rampant um the kakapo wasn't the only birds that had this i mean we, we know that the kiwi is endangered for the same very same reason um the kiwi is slow and stupid and is not used to predators so it just gets wiped out by introduced um, pests. So up until, up until about 1977, they thought this thing was extinct. But then they found a little enclave of them on a little island just below the South Island, which had been protected from all this. So that's where all their breeding efforts are, are, um, are focused upon. So as Ed said, there's as of as of last year, there was only 100. There were only 125 of these th- of these birds left. And one of them had had its genome sequenced, and so I think this guy, what's his name, Andrew Digby, I think um, he's a he's from the Department of Conservation, and um, Bruce Robinson from the University of Otago. They are getting together, and they're going to sequence every single one of these individuals, because he basically what Digby thought was, well, if we can, you know, this is, it's a small sample size. This is in some ways a really unprecedented um, opportunity, because in this case, you can sequence the, the genome of an entire of a species, every single individual of this species. So that way you can get a very comprehensive look at what the genetic structure looks like across this entire set of birds. And you'll be able to, you know, look at things like, well, a whole lot of genes that, you know, you wouldn't have had access to. Things like, what you know, immune, immunity diseases that they might carry or can infect them, um, even their breeding habits and things like that. So... There's already a very, like, they know everything about these birds and how they breed because, as the article says, um, there's a very intensive procedure into (laughs) breeding these damn things. Um, It involves tracking them, um, tracking their movements when they mate. So, (laughs) apparently, they... (laughs) The way they they actually... They can detect when they're actually in the act of coitus. (laughs) <laughs> so as as someone said these birds don't have any dignity left they're, they're being, every, every single thing they do is being followed <laughs> but their, their coitus uh, was, was described as a small hour long jiggle yes and uh... <laughs> if, if anyone has seen the BBC series with Stephen Fry mm. and uh, mm. Mark Cowardine uh, where they go and look at all the 
near extinct animals from when it was done with Douglas Adams 15, 20 awesome. years ago or something. Yeah. It's a great series. But there is the very memorable time when they do go and they find a kakapo uh, yeah. that's part of a conservation program. And it gets rather amorous with Mark's <laughs> head, um, which possibly explains why they're going extinct as well, if well, they then, can't yeah. tell the difference between a female <laughs> parrot and a human head. Um, yeah, they're not the... I, I don't think they're the brightest birds. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, the way this whole system works is you know, once these birds have bred and, you know, once the once the eggs have been laid, they um, they make sure that, you know, that every nest has the right amount of eggs in it so that certain females aren't overburdened or whatever. Um, if if they... Um, apparently, they catch every single male. They collect the sperm from each male, which I'm sure, you know, must be really fun for the males. Actually, maybe it is fun for the males if th that video... Maybe they just provide yeah, like a doll's yeah, head. Maybe. Go for it. Um, and, <laughs> then, and then if a female hasn't mated or is mated with a dud male, they will give, <laughs> they will impregnate oh. the female <laughs> with sperm they know is good. Um, and then once they've hatched, they monitor every single one of these hatchlings. And apparently the the, the food that they can fe they feed these birds at the time isn't always ripe. So, so a lot of these birds are suffering from malnutrition when they get born, when, when they hatch, sorry. So um, that's when they take them and rear them by hand. So it's a really intense. There's certainly a lot to indicate mm. why they're going. I, I agree. It's not just that, that. <laughs> uh, and not only that, apparently I think half their eggs don't even hatch. And of that, of those hatchlings, only 70% of them or something fledge. So <laughs> they're kind of a, they really are kind of an evolutionary dead end. Evolution <laughs> is trying to tell them something, but we're interfering <laughs> and we're getting in the way of evolution. Look, I, I get this because obviously it is it is through human, um, well, humans have had a lot to do with the extinction of these birds. Sure. Or, you know, the, the, so, and it's it's about New Zealand's natural heritage. And I, and I applaud them for this because it's, they are an interesting bird. They are, they are the only flightless parrot in the world. Hmm. Um they are interesting that way. Apparently, along with the, the largest yeah, and the, parrot too. Yeah, the large parrot. Um, and uh, 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 along with a, a few other parrots in New Zealand, they are probably the most ancient parrot lineage in the world. So it's a really good opportunity to look at those birds and say, well, how did they evolve? You know, what was their what was their lineage? What was their background? Um, I think this is really cool. Like it's it, it is an unprecedented kind of um opportunity here, and it also brings to mind. If they can do this for these bird populations, there are other really endangered bird populations, like in Australia, like the orange belly orange belly parrot, for instance, which is highly endangered and also equally as stupid. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and also like a sort of a state emblem kind of thing, so, so of of that kind of diverse importance. So, I think this could be something that, if it starts something, and as Ed's, as as it alluded to in a previous story, things like sequencing. Have become a lot cheaper, so I think the whole price for this sequencing project, or these 120 something birds, actually, I think it's it's now 150 something birds, I think, because 153, yeah, yeah, because I think they had had a bumper year and got a whole whole lot of new ones. Um, but the whole the price for this is estimated to be somewhere along the lines of 110 thousand dollars, which is actually very very cheap when you think about it's very cheap, yeah. How yeah, how big how intensive the sequencing is and how many individuals there are. It's, Sort of a yeah. It's, it's if you'd done this, if you tried to do this ten years ago, it would have been a lot more than that. So there's a, there seems to be quite a big volunteer effort. In oh yeah, I mean the volunteer, the volunteer is that, that's for the breeding program. I'm, I'm talking about the actual cost of sequencing, which is yeah. done by technicians and scientists, and that is actually quite mm, cheap. Oh, but right. yeah, you're right. There is without the volunteers, I don't think they could do this sort of intensive <laughs> breeding program. Like <laughs> there's not enough paid hands for this. I also should point out, I've only just read the correction at the end of this article. Mm. Uh, we were talking about the kakapo could be the first species to have every individual's genome sequenced. Uh, there has been another group oh. that has already sequenced the genomes of every Spix macaw, oh, okay. which is another critically endangered bird. How many of those so, there are? All right. Yep. Probably three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, we shouldn't laugh. Um, yeah. <laughs> But no, it, I think it's interesting that uh, we are now at a point where we can use different methods of conservation and learn more about the animals that we're trying to stave off extinction on. Um, it's really encouraging mm. and really, really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I think that's our show. 
Go to scienceontop.com slash 278 for more information about the Nobel Prizes or the other stories we talked about today. And of course, there you can leave your comments, find our social media links, and if you haven't already, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And a big thank you to our Patreon subscribers. If you want to help us make the show, just go to scienceontop.com slash donate. Shane, Penny, Lucas, thanks for joining me again. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, no worries. Thank you, Ed. This episode was edited with a paper mache volcano by Marcos Benamou. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. You can see he's got a very good camouflage. He has. That colours. So, you know, evolution hasn't entirely rendered him useless. A typical male, Sirocco is clearly only interested in one thing. Hello. Oh, look at that. Ow. God, he's got sharp claws. He's getting a bit frisky. Ow. Ow. Do you think it is a, um, he's actually attempting a sort of mating ritual? He is. He is. <laughs> oh, he <laughs> must. Right. You are sure, sure, sure. Or not? Ow! Go on, shark. Look, he's so happy. I'm sorry, but this is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. <laughs> you are being shagged by a rare parrot. He thinks you are. Ow! And he's really going for it. Wow, you've chosen him. Is it actually you were in pain, aren't you? That's all right. Okay. Oh, my neck is covered. Am I? He's fine, but it's really you know, sharp. Did that hurt? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>